everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on embracing your diversity. Our presenter today is Dr. Manj Burdakar of Concord University. My name is Sidra and I'm a member of the marketing team at Hawks Learning. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A module as we go, and we'll work on answering them at the end. I will now hand it over to our presenter for his presentation. Well, thank you uh, for having me here, and thank you for everyone uh, being present here for uh, this presentation. Um, so my name is Dr. Burdakar. I am an assistant professor of psychology at uh, Concord University. Um, so I want to take this moment and welcome all of you uh, for this presentation. Um, this presentation will involve uh, uh, some um, topics on uh, diversity, what equity, uh, uh, diversity looks like, what inclusion looks like, um, and then we'll watch a little bit of video of um, what uh, changing the world looks like by Le Manoir, um, and then we'll end today with any question and answers that you might have. So let's take a look at uh, embracing your diversity. What does diversity mean? Uh, diversity is differences in racial and ethnic, socioeconomic, geographic, and academic professional backgrounds. People with different opinions, backgrounds, uh, this includes degrees and social experience, religious beliefs, political beliefs, sexual orientation, heritage, and life experiences. I know that's a whole lot of different things, um, but that's what diversity is. Um, in other words, diversity is also called the mix. Um, so essentially, think about what uh, when you make a cake, the different kinds of ingredients uh, that is necessary in order to make a cake. Um, as you can see here, uh, there are a whole different kinds of variety of um, 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 ingredients to make a wonderful cake. Um, and if you remove one of these um, ingredients, or in the situation identities, it becomes really, really difficult uh, to be inclusive, um, which is our next term, um, of making this cake. So making the mix work, right? So uh, the next word is, as I said, inclusion. Inclusion involves bringing together and harnessing diverse forces and resources in a way that is beneficial, okay? Inclusion puts the concept and practice of diversity into action by creating an environment of involvement, respect, and connection. You need to have all three of these pieces, involvement, respect, and connection. If these pieces are not involved, it becomes really hard to provide an environment that feels safe for people, um, where the richness of ideas, backgrounds, and perspectives are harnessed to create business values and overall success. It is very, very important um, to not only have a diverse group of individuals, but it's important to be inclusive of diverse population. Um, in other words, it's basically making the mix work, right? Uh, a moment ago, I talked about um, uh, ingredients for the mix. Um, and then there is making the mix work by coming up with making a cake, right? So if you don't work these ingredients together, um, then the cake doesn't really work out the way you want it to be. It just doesn't become a cake. It might just not work. Um, so with that, let's look at the differences between diversity and inclusion. Diversity is simply a representation of many different types of people. So gender, race, ability, religion, et cetera. Diversity often focuses on differences and is referred to as the mix. As I mentioned, a lot of people look at diversity and say, yeah, we have diversity, this is fantastic. But it is also important to be inclusive, 
of diverse backgrounds. So inclusion is the deliberate act of welcoming diversity and creating an environment where all different kinds of people can thrive and succeed. It's just not including people, but you also have to provide an environment where they can thrive and succeed. Figuring out resources, figuring out spaces that actually work for people. Um, you cannot invite people to a space and say, work it out yourself, because that's not going to be helpful. It is important to provide these resources so people can thrive and succeed. Inclusion is the act of making the mix work. It's very, very important to put the ingredients in a particular manner in order for the mix to work. Um, and, and oftentimes it does work. Um, it, it needs to come from a place of kindness and care and providing space for people to thrive and succeed. Um, diversity is what you have. Inclusion is what you do. Uh, simply having a diverse group, team, workforce, classroom, etc., is not enough. Everyone should feel safe and encouraged to fully participate and share and be on equal footing as everyone else. Whenever we are in a position uh, of uh, including everyone, it is important that you uh, uh, don't one up people. It is important to be on an equal footing. It is important uh, to not be the head of the group um, where you're providing opportunities for everyone. Uh, all voices need to be heard, especially when you're creating an environment that is diverse in its own way. So be mindful of what diversity and inclusion and how, how they are actually interconnected and needed. You can't just have a diverse group of people. Um, you need to also provide uh, an environment that is inclusive. Um, this is uh, true for all uh, uh, areas, including, I'm, I'm a professor, including my classroom, right? Um, it is important to provide a space for people to talk about differences. It is important to talk about similarities sometimes, because that is inclusive. It's also providing space for people to talk about different points of views. Um, to focus different points of views because that actually educates people and helps them understand uh, what diversity and inclusion looks like. Diversity is not just about race. It has to do with a whole lot of different aspects as we just uh, spoke about. It has to do with socioeconomic status. It has to do with geographic area. Some people are from rural uh, places. Some people are from uh, urban places. Some are from uh, the city. Some are from uh, suburban places. So it really um, depends on um, um, you know, where people come from and they come from different points of views. So with that, um, I wanna take a moment and show you this video. Uh, by Le Manoir, um, which is essentially the secret of changing the world. Um, so this is a little bit older video, but I think it touches on the point of how um, important diversity and inclusion is um, and what happens when you don't include people and how important it is um, to do the little things uh, in the right way. So here we go. So I don't think we can actually hear. Uh, if you want to try unsharing and then when the screen comes up to screen share, select the share audio as well. Um, oh. Okay. That way you can share the audio as well. Share sound, is that? Yep. Okay. Uh... 
for some reason it is not allowing me to do that well if you unshare your screen and okay. then when you come back into into uh zoom to share your screen it should bring up the option to share which screen you want and on that it has yeah you so so i clicked on that but it is not allowing me to show the sound unfortunately there's an error message coming up oh no yeah um okay so is it possible that I can send you the video and you could possibly share? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, well, let's see here. Let me stop sharing here just for a moment. I apologize. Um, Bear with us all, it's technical okay. difficulties. Uh, if you have the link, you can just chat it to me and then yeah. I'll your screen. I will do that here. No matter what you're in the mood for. Okay. Um, I have put it in the chat. <clears throat> Friends would walk up to me and just be like, what the f is in your mug? And I would just tell them. I'm just going to let the ads clear. Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. You know, I've been listening to all the different speakers today, and uh, I realized I was the only Asian person on today. And even today, as I'm standing here, I was thinking of how many times in my life, going into corporate America and government agencies and educational institutions, how oftentimes I'd look out in the audience for someone who looked like me. How many of you know what I'm talking about by a raise of hands? Yeah. And I was thinking that when I was growing up, by the way, my name is, is Le Munwa, and uh, it means he who writes. And my parents took two months to find my name. But on the day that I was born, they wrote Gary. <laughs> now, what I want you to notice is that I didn't laugh, but you did. Because for me, it's not funny at all. Because I often wondered, why? I think it was because my father, when he came to this country, he was called Lei Huwa, and his name was changed to Richard because his country couldn't pronounce it. I think it was my first dosage of what it was like in a multicultural nation that when it can't pronounce your name, or actually what I learned was, if it wasn't in English, it was not pronounceable, unless, of course, you were French, Australian, or English. It was beautiful, the way it sounded. And today, I think that that's part of what I want to talk about, is what I think it would take to change the world. I think it's being conscious and noticing that I didn't laugh when you did. And maybe even for you to ask me, why didn't you laugh? What was coming up for you? I love my name, Le Manoir. I hate that name, Gary. Not that I don't think that Gary is a beautiful name, but I remember the children laughing at me when I shared them what my Chinese name was. And I remember coming to school with this beautiful box of what we called si yu gai, which is soy sauce chicken, and bok phan, and lap cheng, which is steamed pork. God, I'm getting hungry right now. And what happened was, I remember bringing it, I was only in, in the first grade. And I remember putting it underneath my chair because, and covering it with my clothes because I didn't want anyone to take it from me. And then I remembered some child in the back said, ooh, what's that horrible smell? And then I realized that child and the class 
was talking about my food underneath my desk. And then I started to hide it even more so so that no one would see it. But in the process, I started to think what was wrong about my food. I had never thought that it was smelly. I had never thought that it didn't smell well. I thought it was a beautiful aroma. And then when the lunch bell rang, I'll never forget this. As I took that box and my colored chopsticks and I threw it in the garbage can. I don't think a day goes by that I don't realize, even like right now, that I didn't throw away just my food. I threw away a part of myself. I threw away my beautiful Chinese accent. I didn't wear any of my Chinese clothing. No one asked me ever to speak any words in Chinese to learn. And I remember the kids doing this, Jing Chong, Chinamen. And for the very first time, I went home to look at my eyes. And I realized that my eyes, for the first time, might not be as beautiful as a white person's eyes. No wonder that even in Japan, they still have surgery on their eyes to look more like Westerners. My God, what have we lost? And today, when I'm standing in front of you today, my son is in the audience. I remember when my son, who's adopted from Guatemala, his name is Joaquin. I remembered he looks very much like my, my ex-wife and I, she's Dutch, and we adopted him because he would look like a, a, a mix between the two of us. And so when he went to school, preschool, they all thought that he was Chinese. And they kept thinking how smart he was, and he was. And they kept just saying how intelligent, how quickly he was learning his alphabet and things like this. And then one day, Joaquin told them that he was not Chinese, but rather he was Guatemalan. And then from that day on, they only complimented him on his soccer. Now, how did that happen? What was missing? I think that as a Chinese man born in this country, born in Oakland, California, just next door, I think that what I started to realize in going to school, where I saw none of my teachers were Chinese, none of them were hardly people of color at all, no administrator absolutely wasn't, that I started to realize that being different meant being not white. I started to realize all the different ways that I could blend in. And then I remembered there was a loss that occurred where suddenly people started saying to me, my gosh, you speak such good English, where'd you learn it from? So even though my name was Gary, and even though I spoke perfect English, it was as if I were still a foreigner. I think this country has a huge mythology, and the mythology is, is that our differences are valued. I don't think so. I think they're celebrated. I think that if you really value someone's culture, you integrate it into your workplaces, even in today, in our businesses. It becomes part of the culture. You see, I'm much more than Bruce Lee, much more than Chinese New Year. I want to let you know today as I stand before you that it's not what I have in common with white people that makes me significant, but rather that my differences are beautiful and that they're wonderful, and that this gi that I wear that my people had to cut off, and that this beautiful Tibetan shirt that I wear is part of my clothing and not just a costume to be celebrated. That I want to tell you that in the way that I move and that I express myself is part of my people and my ancestors. When I was listening and watching the film of the young black man who had lost his best friend. I had lost my mother because a black man shot my mother five times in the head. I came to become a filmmaker because differences drove that young man at our school. He was caught gambling. A young black man was caught gambling in the bathrooms at our school. And what happened was, rather than dealing with young black men in those days, they decided simply to transfer him. 
The consequence of that was he screamed and yelled and held onto the doorknobs because he kept saying, this is my neighborhood, this is where my friends are. But they simply transferred him because they were scared to work with black boys in those days. Fifteen years later, he found his way to my mother's doorway. And I remember when, he, when I found out my mom being shot, my father said, you see what I told you about black men? They're murderers and they're robbers and you can't trust them. And what I kept thinking was, as long as we keep telling black men that, after a while they start to believe that they're part of the problem. I strongly believe today as I'm standing in front of you that I wished people would have asked me as a young Chinese child and later on when I became a therapist and filmmaker. I wished in my classes my teachers would have asked me a whole set of questions. Simple ones like when people look at you, what do they see? What don't they see? I wish they could see that inside I had so much to say. If only they would look at me instead of waiting for me to raise my hand or interrupt somebody. If only they could realize that sometimes I wondered why some people did all the talking and simply interrupted other people and there wasn't always an opportunity for everyone to speak in a room. I wonder why they didn't see me. The other one is what I wish they would see inside of me. That there was so much I noticed in each person. And that when I became a teacher, I told my students, it's not that you can't learn. It's just that we haven't figured out a way to teach you. I looked at every child on the first day that I taught. I wanted to go every single child. And no matter what they were wearing, I'd always walk them and say, ooh, I love your tennis shoes. Ooh, that's a badass tattoo. Tell me more about it. Are those earrings? or whatever it might be. I didn't eat with the teachers, I ate out at lunch because I wanted to see the children in their own worlds and what they were like. And what I want to tell you is that Jesse Jackson's dead wrong. The most segregated time in America is not on Sunday, it's at lunchtime in every one of our schools in this country. I want to tell you that the issues that we have with this president is not because of his policies, but because he's black that we say no to this black man with policies that he even duplicates of the Republicans because he is black. And I'm wondering who in this country is ever going to finally say that? That who in this country is finally going to say that no, it is not the opportunity for everyone. None of your Muslim, Chinese, gay, black, disabilities, poor. The odds of your becoming the President of the United States are almost zero. You see, the truth of it is we celebrate our differences, but we don't practice them. We don't use them in everyday life. We're more multi-holiday than we are multicultural. So where, what, happens, what happens to this next generation when they discover and take on our racism and our stereotypes? I remember that I was in Harlem, and there was a group of, I was working with about 600 high school students, and I said, I'd like you to tell the truth of how you feel about race. And finally, one Asian boy from, uh, a student from, was born in Hong Kong, came down and said, okay, I'll tell you the truth. I'm scared of going to Harlem. I hear that they rob you and they cheat you and the food's really bad and you, know, you never wanna go there. And then I asked the students to please raise your hand, how many have heard of Harlem in that way? And all these students raised their hands. And here they were all sitting together, but not together, just a lot like today. You're all sitting together, but whether or not you say hello or talk to each other, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? In fact, for people you don't even know, you're probably at least one seat away from them anyway. And so what happened was, I was standing there thinking, well, what shall I do here? All of my life, I've heard about Harlem too. How do I convince this young Chinese boy and all these other students? And so something came to me. And so I said, who lives in Harlem? And all these black students raised their hands. And I said, come on down. And what I want you to do is, I want you to tell this group, what do you love about Harlem? And then they started to share one by one the beautiful smells and the foods and their uncles and aunts who had shops there and the beautiful music of Harlem and the art and the grandfathers and the grandparents who lived there and the long history, that it was absolutely beautiful. And in the evenings, it just came alive. And then one Asian student raised his hand and said, 
could you show me that Harlem? And then that student says, says, come on over here. And then another student raises his hand, and pretty soon almost the entire audience raised their hands, could you show me that Harlem? You see, that's exactly what it's going to take. We're going to have to walk through our fears to see another world. We're going to have to take a chance to get to know another person's life. We saw a film today of a young black man who lost his best friend. And I was so touched as I was listening to him out in the hallway. We were talking. But it's not enough to simply be touched. That loss will be with him for the rest of his life. And what I want to tell him, as I did when I was in the hallway, was that there's nothing wrong with you. There's something in our society that tells young black men and people of color that they're not worth it, that we choose to be poor, that we choose minimum wage. But I strongly believe that unless we start to create communities, taking care of each other, reaching out, we have enough money in this country that we spend on wars that we could take care of our communities. In closing, what I'd like to do is to share with this with you. It was a story that I remember quite well when I finished high school. And I graduated as the president of Oakland High. And one of my best friends said to me, Manoir, why don't you come on home with me? And he was black. And I went, because ah, my father told me never to go into a black neighborhood. And I said, OK. So we kind of dragged my, dragged my feet along. And as we were dragging, he goes, Manoir, catch up with me. And I said, said, OK, Donald, OK. But I was really scared out of my mind of what might happen to me. And as we were walking along, what I realized to Don, what I said was, you know, Don, I know this neighborhood. And as we got closer, I said, I grew up in this neighborhood. In fact, this is the same block that I was born in. And Don said, wow, what a coincidence. And then we started to walk up to his house, and guess what? The house that he lived in was the house that I was born in. And I looked at Don with tears in my eyes, and I said, you know, Don, you were inviting me into your home where you were never welcomed, and I was told never to bring you home. And what I'd like to do is to tell you this today, that perhaps that is the secret to changing the world, that each and every one of us has to take the time to walk each other home. I thank you. So as you can see, um, this had a lot of information in here uh, about diversity and how, uh, how important it is to understand other people and how important it is to get to know where people are coming from because people are not that different after all. Um, I have a second video that I wanted to uh, show. Um, hopefully we can share that video as well. Um, and it's, it's a short video, um, basically talks about uh, how we can, we should respect people uh, and how important it is to respect each other, even with all of our differences um, um, that we carry every day. Would it be possible to share that video as well? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. We're unable to see the screen. Give me one quick second. Sure, thank you. Thank you for everyone's patience um, when we try to figure this out here. Okay. 
Okay, can you see it now? Yep. Perfect. using these for ear cleaning they're even so as you can see um that um this video also illustrates how important it is to respect everyone and respect everyone from who are from all different backgrounds and how inclusion diversity and inclusion is an important aspect and what i ask you to do moving forward is to uh, have a reflective uh, period of asking yourself, what does diversity look like for you? And how can you be uh, a, a bigger proponent of inclusion? Um, so um, with that, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm open to any questions. Um, if not, thank you for your time. Um, if Go ahead and, and uh, ask me any kind of questions that you might have. Um, I don't have any in the Q&A right now. Mm -hmm. But people can put any questions that they have in the Q&A section. Okay, we have a chat. What was the name of the first video? Yeah, the name of the first video was called The Secret of Changing the World by Lei Manoa.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or? I believe that is it for now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that looks like all the time that we have for questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burdekar. And thank yep, you. I think there's one more question here. Okay. Oh, there is one. Okay. Uh, how is an instructor to balance inclusion without offer, uh, offending a student? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to do this is asking students. Um, um, I know there is a sense of um, um, an idea that we are superior as faculty um, uh, and the students are inferior. I think bridging that gap is very, very important. Uh, trying to uh, uh, bridge that gap um, where actually we're in an educational setting where we all are learning. Um, the one other thing that I also do is in my syllabus at the very beginning, I tell people that, you know, I might offend people. Um, please correct me um, if, if you are offended. I mean, coming from a place of like, I'm not perfect either. Um, because I'm not, um, we're all here to learn um, and, and understand and respect people. I think that uh, in itself will help ease that tension for you as well. And every time when, when we're talking about difficult subject, um, I think it's important that we basically bring up that I might offend people, um, but it's not my job to offend people but we all make mistakes, but let's have a constructive conversation about these issues. And if I make a mistake, please let me know. Uh, a lot of times students um, will come forward and let you know, and you can apologize and move forward. Um, because every day there is new things coming up, right? And it's so hard to, to keep up with something that is new. Um, so basically suggesting that you didn't know you were wrong and you learned from that experience. Hopefully that gives you an idea. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next question, if we need to move beyond celebrating cultural events such as holidays to integrating the culture, how do we do that with limited time to introduce top topics? Um, it is hard. Um, I, I agree um, with you. Um, but we got to start somewhere, right? Um, um, and it doesn't start just from us. It's also a systemic issue. Um, so let me reread this. How do we do that with limited time to introduce topics? I think um, I think it's important that we introduce the topic. Um, we, our job, as at least I think this from my point of view, um, our job as educators is to plant the seed, um, hoping that they take away something and hopefully someday that grows into a plant and eventually a tree. Um, and there is a ripple effect of change. And I truly believe that. Um, where you basically, you know, do something good uh, or teach them something uh, new, hopefully they'll take away and there is a ripple effect of that moving forward. Um, and hopefully there's a systemic change um, in the future. I hope I answered that question. I think that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm open to any questions. Um, there are no such thing as stupid questions or anything, and I'll do my best to answer. I know some people might be typing, so it might take you a minute, so. I think it's also the other thing as I'm sitting here thinking about it more, I think it's important to at least talk about um, um, events. If we're not celebrating them, at least integrating them in, in our classes. 
Um, I think that's that's also very, very important. We we have to uh, learn about them and try and integrate them in our classes as well. And I, I don't know what your all's profession, um, if your faculty, staff, I don't know, but I think either way, I think it's important to integrate it in your everyday life. Um, I think it's important to integrate it in what you do, uh, make it a habit, and hopefully that will continue. All right, I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burdekar, and thank you all for attending today. Uh, if any of you or your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing, web, uh, growing website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat right now. Um, we will be emailing you a link to view the recording of this webinar once it's available, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out the webinar. It was a pleasure working with you. Here on mute. Thank you. No problem. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah, bye.